got you going. So thank you, Jesse, for that beyond kind introduction. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you all about therapeutic targeting of leukemia stem cells to prevent T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's kind of a broad title, as Jen Jesse mentioned. Um, I've been involved in a variety of different projects in lab. Um, and so I'm gonna to talk to you today about two different projects, but both of them focus on um, relapse or poor prognosis in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the first part of my talk is going to focus on PRL3 um, as a therapeutic target to inhibit leukemia stem cell self renewal. And then the second part is going to talk about cell free DNA um, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia as a biomarker. So every day, 43 kids are diagnosed with cancer in the United States. Um, and leukemia is the most common pediatric cancer, making up about 25% of um, pediatric cancers um, with central nervous system tumors, lymphoma, and sarcomas following behind. Um, and T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which our lab studies, is a subset of leukemia that makes up about 10 to 15% of acute leukemias. Um, and this is characterized by an aggressive malignancy of the thymocytes or the T cells that are present in the thymus. Um, and the patients present with an acute onset of symptoms, um, often fever, chills, night sweats, fatigue. Um, and they will have these leukemic blasts, which are characteristic of the disease um, present in their thymus and in the bone marrow. Um, and these patients can also get an enlarged thymus outlined here in red on CT scan um, from accumulation of the blasts in the thymus of patients. And this is unique to TL. Um, the oncogenes MYC and NOTCH are the central regulators of this disease, and that will be important later in my talk. Um, and there's no molecularly targeted therapies available for TL. So this is a major opportunity for um, ongoing research. Relapse is a major clinical concern in TL, and the prognosis of TL is much worse than BL, um, with a, about 80% five-year survival, which sounds really good. However, about 25% of patients will go on to relapse, with less than 30% of children and less than 10% of adults surviving this relapse. And this Kaplan-Meier curve here shows that the prognosis for um, patients above the age of 30 is actually much worse than um, patients below the age of 30. And the pathways responsible for relapse are largely unknown. So it's known that cancer stem cells drive cancer relapse, um, just like normal stem cells, which are able to undergo self renewal and repopulate their population and differentiation, forming progenitor cells and then mature tissue. Um, these normal stem cells can acquire mutations and form cancer stem cells, which can also undergo self renewal and differentiation to form an entire cancer. And it's, uh, I wanna point out also that these cancer stem cells have a lot of the same drug resistant mechanisms that normal stem cells do, making them very treatment resistant and difficult to target. So just like cancer stem cells, leukemia stem cells drive leukemia relapse. This here shows in purple, the bulk leukemia cells, which make up the majority of the patient's leukemia. And then these yellow cells depict leukemia stem cells, which make up a very small proportion of the patient leukemia cells. When you treat these patients with traditional chemotherapy, it targets the actively dividing bulk leukemia cells and will get rid of them. However, these leukemia stem cells are left behind and they can undergo self renewal um, and differentiation to form relapse in patients. So our thought is that we could use leukemia stem cell targeted chemotherapy to target these leukemia stem cells directly and eliminate them. And then you can combine this with traditional chemotherapy to then shrink and get rid of the leukemia and the patients won't go on to have relapse. It's known that in TL, um, self renewal can be regulated by beta catenin signaling and knockout of beta catenin in a primary mouse leukemia model showed an increase in survival um, and a decrease in the leukemia stem cell frequency. Um, and this was demonstrated by another group working on TL. And so this proves a proof of principle that if you could target beta catenin signaling, um, you might be able to target these leukemia stem cell driven um, self renewal um, and, and eliminate the leukemia stem cells. However, direct targeting of beta catenin in patients is toxic, and these patients in clinical trials have had significant gut um, toxicities that have caused the clinical trials. 
Um, and also you wanna be careful targeting developmental pathways in pediatric patients who are still undergoing normal development. So our thought is that if we could identify novel pathways that were specific to the leukemia stem cells that were mod modulating this um, beta catenin and driven self renewal, that would be able to target this self renewal specifically in the leukemia stem cells without having a lot of the off target side effects that are seen with inhibiting the beta catenin and signaling pathway everywhere. So as Jesse mentioned, our lab uses a zebrafish model for cancer research. And zebrafish have about 70% of the, um, or sorry, about 70% of the protein coding genes in humans also have a counterpart in zebrafish. So they're a great model for cancer research. And there's already a lot of cancer models um, that have been developed in zebrafish. They're really good for in vivo imaging of live um, cancer progression, genetic approaches such as transgenesis and loss of function, um, where you can look at the effects of certain genes overexpression or knockdown of genes on cancer progression, high throughput drug screening where you can put single fish into each well of a 96 well plate um, and do large scale drug screening. Um, and then bioinformatics approaches where you can large, use um, large numbers of zebrafish and get really significant um, bioinformatics results. So our lab uses a transgenic MIC-induced zebrafish model of TL, and this recapitulates an aggressive and treatment resistant um, TL subtype at a molecular level. And these leukemias are heterogeneous, um, and this is a leukemia stem cell driven disease in these zebrafish, which is important for the rest of my talk. Um, and so we use um, a RAG2 promoter, which is a B and T cell promoter to overexpress the MYC oncogene, which I mentioned was one of the drivers of leukemia in TL. Um, and we also couple this with expression of a red fluorescent protein. And so here you can see expression of the red fluorescent protein um, with the RAG2 promoter shows the uh, fluorescence of the T cells located in the thymus. This is the thymus of the zebrafish. Um, and when you couple this with the MYC oncogene overexpression, these zebrafish will develop a red fluorescent leukemia that then progresses and takes over the body of the zebrafish and will circulate through the bloodstream. When you sort out these zebrafish leukemia blasts, which are characteristic of um, t all, um, they mimic what we see in human disease as well. So in order to make this zebrafish model, um, we do single cell injections of zebrafish embryos um, with our DNA overexpressing MYC um, or MCherry. And then we wait about 21 days and screen for a red fluorescent thymus, um, and then wait for the leukemia to develop in the zebrafish to make a primary tumor. Um, and after about 30 days to 90 days, this leukemia will develop and take over the entire zebrafish. Um, and then we can do limiting dilution transplantation, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so one unique advantage of zebrafish is that we have this genetically identical zebrafish strain, which was created by Sergei Revskoy in our lab. And we're one of the only labs in the world to have this strain to be able to do these assays looking at leukemia stem cell frequency. So we take these primary leukemias, which I just um, talked to you about how they were made, and harvest those M cherry positive leukemia cells, and then transplant different cell numbers into the zebrafish. Um, here we transplant 25,000 cells, 10,000, all the way down to 10 cells at different doses into different number of zebrafish, um, and then wait to see which fish will develop leukemia and quantify the number of fish that develop a leukemia in each group. So for example, in this 1,000 cell group, three out of the five fish developed a leukemia. Um, because we know that the self renewal is confined to leukemia stem cells, any fish that develops a leukemia must have had a leukemia stem cell present. And we can quantify the leukemia stem cell frequency by assessing the number of fish with leukemia at each dose of cells transplanted. Um, and then we can use a, a limiting dilution analysis software to then quantify the stem cell frequency. So for the example I just showed you, where at the 1,000 cell dose, three out of five transplanted zebrafish uh, developed a leukemia, the leukemia stem cell frequency would be about one in 306 cells um, is a leukemia stem cell, which is how you'll see the um, stem cell frequency depicted in this talk. 
Um, and in zebrafish, the leukemia stem cell frequency can be as high as 1%, whereas in mouse models, the stem cell frequency is about one in 1 million, making it a much harder um, population to study in mouse models. And it might be higher because in our zebrafish model, we're actually assessing the functional leukemia stem cell frequency, and we're not biasing our results by using um, leukemia stem cell markers, which aren't very well characterized to be sorting for potential leukemia stem cells. So during her postdoc, um, Jessie did this 8,000 animal zebrafish screen um, where she took primary zebrafish leukemias and then did single cell transplants to get clonal leukemias and then took these clonal leukemias and did serial limiting dilution transplantation um, where she transplanted different cell numbers into different um, numbers of zebrafish and then assessed the leukemia stem cell frequency over time of each of these tumors. Um, and she found that in most of these leukemias, the leukemia stem cell frequency remained the same over time. However, in a subset, six of these 47 clones, they actually evolved an increase in the leukemia stem cell frequency over time. And so she wanted to see what was driving this increase in self renewal um, in these zebrafish leukemias. So first she did RNA sequencing, comparing the high and low self renewal leukemias and identified the Wnt beta catenin signaling pathway as a driver of self renewal. Um, and this RNA sequencing looked at gene expression changes um, and identified 2,500 differentially expressed genes between the high and low self renewal leukemias. Um, and these 2,500 genes were enriched for the Wnt or beta catenin signaling pathway the AKT pathway and the FGFR signaling pathways, um, which have also been shown to be expressed in um, leukemia stem cells in human disease as well. She also did a ray CGH to look at genomic level um, changes and found 16 recurrent amplifications that occurred in more than 30% of the high cell for new, or the high um, leukemia stem cell frequency zebrafish cancers. Um, and these amplifications were small and often contained only one gene. And interestingly, in human TL, about 10% of patients will have amplification of an arm of chromosome eight, which has hundreds of genes on it. And when we looked um, and compared the zebrafish array CGH, the only gene that came up um, in the array CGH in the zebrafish that also came, that also was in this um, chromosome eight arm that's amplified in humans was PRL3. And so she decided to look further into the function of PRL3 as a driver of self renewal. So PRL3 is a dual specificity protein tyrosine phosphatase, um, and it contains this critical PTP domain, which is responsible for its activity as a phosphatase. Specifically, the C104 residue here is critical for its phosphatase activity, and it also has a prenylation motif, um, specifically the C170 residue here, which is critical for um, prenylation of PRL3 and its localization to the plasma membrane. Um, human t all samples highly express PRL3, and it's a known oncogenic phosphatase. It's associated with invasion and metastasis in many types of solid tumors, and as a whole, phosphatases are underutilized as drug targets in cancer, and there's very few FDA-approved phosphatase inhibitors, making it an opportunity um, for new targeted therapies. Um, and so this shows that um, in patient samples, healthy bone marrow expresses low levels of PRL3, but in patient TL samples, there's an, a significant increase in PRL3 expression, showing that what we find in the zebrafish um, leukemias was also true in human samples. Um, and Min Wei, a previous graduate student in our lab, um, looked at patient TL samples um, and found that a subset of patient TL samples also highly expressed PRL3 compared to healthy um, peripheral blood controls as well. And so PRL3 has been um, known to be involved in many oncogenic processes, especially in solid tumors, such as migration, invasion, proliferation, and metastasis in mouse models. Um, and it's shown to be involved in cancer progression in melanoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, and colon cancer. However, the role for PRL3 in TL really has not been defined, and there's not been any evidence of um, PRL3 involvement in leukemia, or sorry, in self renewal at this point. 
So as Jesse mentioned last year, Min and I um, had a paper that came out looking at defining the role of PRL3 in TL. Um, and we found that PRL3 overexpression led to enhanced migratory ability of cells. It facilitated TL engraftment and circulation in a mouse model. Um, it also led to the rapid onset of TL and enhanced circulation of the TL cells in our zebrafish model. And this was through um, the SARC signaling pathway. Um, and so on the next few slides, I'll go through some of the data, the zebrafish data from this paper. So first, um, I overexpressed PRL3 in our zebrafish leukemia model um, shown here in maroon, and then compared this to the MIC control leukemias. Um, and found that when you overexpress PRL3, there's a significant increase in progression of these leukemias in the zebrafish model. Um, and this is at the same time point. Um, and you can see that MIC leukemias still are localized to the thymus and really haven't escaped, whereas the PRL3 expressing leukemias um, start to take over the body of the zebrafish a lot faster. We also looked at um, circulation um, and found that the migration or circulation of PRL3 cells um, is increased when you overexpress um, PRL3 in these leukemias compared to the MIC control leukemias. Um, and this is important because when you overexpress PRL3, there's an increase in um, migration of these leukemia cells out of their niche. Um, and then finally, we wanted to make sure that PRL3 overexpression wasn't affecting any of the core characteristics of the zebrafish leukemia. And so we looked at the leukemia cell morphology and found that the blasts look similar between the MIC control group and the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias. Um, the expression of MIC oncogene was similar between both the um, MIC control and the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias. And then lastly, we wanted to characterize these leukemias by real time PCR um, and make sure that they were, in fact, overexpressing T cell genes shown here. Um, and not expressing B cell um, genes. So they were in fact T cell leukemias. And then finally, we um, looked at expression of PRL3 to confirm that they were actually overexpressing PRL3. Um, and interestingly, um, the control, which was zebrafish whole blood is shown here in yellow. Um, and the MIC control tumors actually overexpressed PRL3 compared to the control healthy blood um, about tenfold, showing that PRL3 might actually be critical for um, leukemia onset in our control MIC induced um, leukemias as well. However, our PRL3 overexpressing leukemias expressed about um, a 500 to 1,000 fold increase in PRL3 over those MIC controls. So, to figure out what was driving this increase in progression um, when PRL3 was overexpressed, I first looked at the um, leukemia cell proliferation by EDU staining and flow cytometry and found that there was no significant difference in the proliferation rate of these PRL3 overexpressing leukemias. I next looked at apoptosis by an XM5 staining and flow cytometry um, and found that there was no significant difference um, in the rate of apoptosis between the MIC control and the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias as well. So then I did limiting dilution transplantation to assess the leukemia stem cell frequency in our zebrafish model to see if this was responsible or might help to explain some of the increase in progression that we saw. Um, and when we increased or overexpressed PRL3, we saw about a four and a half fold increase in the leukemia stem cell frequency compared to the MIC control leukemias. Um, with each of these um, dots on the graph representing limiting dilution transplantation of about 40 zebrafish from each primary leukemia sample. Um, and even after transplantation, the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias progressed much faster than the MIC control leukemias. So to try and get an idea of how PRL3 was actually contributing to increased um, progression and leukemia stem cell frequency in TL, I overexpressed two different um, zebrafish mutant forms of PRL3. Um, and looked at the progression and then the leukemia stem cell frequency. So first I overexpressed a um, phosphatase dead mutant shown here in purple and found that the leukemia progression actually decreased almost to the rate of the MIC control leukemias um, with the phosphatase dead mutant. 
suggesting that the PRL3 phosphatase activity might actually be important in its role in leukemia progression. And then I overexpressed this PRL3 C170S mutant, which um, is a mutation in the prenylation motif, leading to PRL3 being localized in the nucleus. Um, and found an increase in the leukemia stem cell frequency, suggesting that the cellular localization of PRL3 might actually be playing a role in um, PRL3's function in leukemia stem cell self renewal. And Caroline Smith, a graduate student in our lab, is going to be following up on some of these studies, defining the role of PRL3 cel uh, cellular localization on its function. So in order to show that PRL3 might be a potential target for leukemia stem cells, um, I inhibited PRL3 with a commercially available PRL inhibitor um, and then did limiting dilution transplantation in our zebrafish model to look at the leukemia stem cell frequency to see if you drug treat against PRL3 if the leukemia stem cell frequency actually changes. So in the DMSO control group, the leukemia stem cell frequency from this tumor was about one in six cells was a leukemia stem cell. Um, and when you treat with a PRL inhibitor, the leukemia stem cell um, frequency went to about one in 67 cells being a, a leukemia stem cell, um, which was about an 11 fold reduction in the leukemia stem cell frequency, proving that at least in our zebrafish make induced model, PRL3 might actually be a, a potential drug target for um, decreasing leukemia stem cell frequency. So we were really excited by this data, um, finding that PRL3 might be a drug target in zebrafish, but we wanted to make sure this held true in human cells as well. And so we did colony formation assay in Min Wei, who was a previous graduate student in our lab, actually helped with this assay. Um, and we took leukemia cells, spun them down, and then resuspended them in a semi-solid methyl cellulose-based media and plated these cells for two weeks, and then counted the number of colonies that formed as a measure of the leukemia stemness. Um, and we found that when we knocked down PRL3 with shRNA, we see a significant decrease in the number of colonies that forms, um, showing that the stemness of PRL3 can be modulated in human leukemia stems um, in human leukemia samples as well. So we went back to the patient samples um, and wanted to see kind of how PRL3 might be working to increase the stem cell frequency and progression in um, zebrafish and human samples. And so we took this top quartile of PRL3 expressing leukemias shown here in red, um, and then the bottom quartile of PRL3 expressing leukemias and did gene set enrichment analysis to compare what was different between these PRL3 high leukemias, which is also shown here in red, and the PRL3 low expressing leukemias shown here in blue, and found that beta-catenin signaling was significantly enriched in the PRL3 high, high expressing leukemias compared to the PRL3 low. Um, and so we went back to the zebrafish leukemias and did Western blot looking at beta catenin expression. First, we probed for PRL3, showing that PRL3 protein was actually increased in these PRL3 overexpressing leukemias compared to the MIC control, um, which matched the real-time data that we had found. Um, and then we probed for beta catenin and found that beta catenin expression was significantly increased in the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias as well um, compared to the MIC control, matching what we saw in the patient data. So as I mentioned earlier, beta catenin signaling is critical in TL. Um, and when beta catenin signaling is involved in self renewal, proliferation, and differentiation, and in a beta catenin reporter mouse leukemia model, um, transplantation of non active beta catenin signaling leukemia cells shows a significant increase in survival compared to beta catenin expressing leukemia cells. Um, and these beta catenin expressing leukemia cells are actually significantly enriched in leukemia stem cells as well. However, as I mentioned earlier, direct targeting of beta catenin in patients is toxic. Um, and so we wanted to see if PRL3 could play a role in modulating beta-catenin signaling in these leukemia stem cells um, and have less to um, toxic effects. 
So the Wnt signaling pathway um, is a little bit complex. And so I'm just gonna briefly go over what happens um, when Wnt ligand is present, it binds to its receptors on the plasma membrane, um, which leads to activation of beta catenin, um, separating it from the destruction complex and translocation of beta catenin into the nucleus where it binds TCF and left transcription factors and leads to transcription of Wnt downstream target genes. Um, and when you take this TCF left binding site, you can then couple it with a downstream reporter gene um, as a readout of Wnt signaling activity. And so for this assay, we use luminescence as a reporter gene for our human cell lines, um, and then GFP fluorescence as a readout in our zebrafish model. Um, and so, First, we used a TCF left GFP reporter zebrafish line. Um, and at about 40 hours post fertilization, there's wind expression due to normal development, both in the tail and in the head of these zebrafish. Um, and in our DMSO control group, um, we saw this normal pattern of GFP or wind signaling expression in the tail. When we treat with bio, which is a known wind pathway activator, we see an increase in beta catenin or GFP expression. And XAV, which is a known one inhibitor, we see a decrease in GFP expression. And we were really excited when we treated with a PRL inhibitor, we actually saw almost a complete decrease in the GFP expression um, to the level that we saw with the XAV one inhibitor. Um, and this was also dose responsive, seeing even more of a decrease in the GFP fluorescence full change compared to the DMSO control with a 10 micromolar dose compared to a five micromolar dose of this inhibitor. And so we characterize that there's a role of PRL3 signaling in the beta, or PRL3 in the beta catenin signaling pathway in our zebrafish model, but we wanted to look at human cells as well and see if this interaction still um, was true. And so we use the um, luminescent reporter um, cell line and overexpressed PRL3 and found about a four and a half fold increase in beta catenin signaling um, when you overexpress PRL3 in human cells. Um, and when we knock down PRL3 with shRNA or treat with the PRL inhibitor, we saw a significant decrease in beta catenin expression, um, demonstrating that PRL3 might be modulating beta catenin signaling in human cell lines. So to wrap up the first part of my talk, focusing on PRL3 as a therapeutic target to inhibit leukemia stem cell self-renewal, um, I've shown that PRL3 increases the leukemia onset and progression in our zebrafish model. I've also shown that PRL3 increases the leukemia stem cell frequency in vivo in our model, um, and that PRL3 knockdown can decrease colony formation in human leukemia cells in vitro. And finally, that PRL3 signaling cascade through beta catenin might serve as a potential uh, target for leukemia stem cells. And this was demonstrated both in vivo in our zebrafish model and in vitro in um, human cell lines. Um, so for future directions, um, there's a few things that we're still working on wrapping up for this project. Um, first, we're in the middle of doing a study looking at PRL3 modulation of the stemness of patient-derived samples. And so we took patient-derived xenograft samples, um, have injected them into immune-compromised mice. And once these um, leukemias form, we're going to um, treat with the PRL inhibitor and then knock down PRL3 and look at the colony formation assay as a measure of stemness to see if PRL3 inhibition can actually modulate stemness of these primary patient samples. Um, Min also had done a bioID assay looking at potential um, targets of PRL3 and identified casein kinase 1, which is involved in the Wnt signaling pathway as a possible PRL3 target. Um, and I also did RNA sequencing comparing the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias to the MIT control leukemias and found again casein kinase 1 epsilon was overexpressed in the PRL3 overexpressing leukemias compared to the MIT control. And so we're gonna follow up this possibility of casein kinase being a target of PRL3 um, to modulate the beta catenin or Wnt signaling pathway. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about a more clinical project um, that I started doing in the lab, still focusing on um, 
acute leukemia progression um, and poor prognosis and relapse using um, cell-free DNA as a biomarker in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So there's a lack of biomarkers that are available as indicators of disease outcome in acute leukemia. Right now, age, sex, and minimal residual disease, or MRD, are the main predictors or main prognostic indicators. And MRD just means that there's a small residual amount of disease present, shown here in green with these cancer cells, amongst many healthy cells in patients after um, a cycle of treatment. And so limit of detection is a problem with MRD. And also this is a very invasive procedure. So MRD is determined by bone marrow biopsy, which is really painful for patients. And so if we could eliminate or decrease the number of bone marrow biopsies patients would have to have, um, that would be a huge bonus. Um, and then also you have to wait until the end of induction chemotherapy to know the MRD status of these patients. So if there was a way to monitor more closely over time, the response to treatment, and you wouldn't have to wait until the end of induction chemotherapy, you might be able to modulate the treatment accordingly. Another main issue in ALL is the central nervous system disease, which is associated with a poor prognosis. And CNS involvement is very common in ALL. In fact, patients all get um, prophylactic treatment with intrathecal chemotherapy, um, either into a port in the central nervous system or by lumbar puncture into the cerebral spinal fluid. And this central nervous system disease is associated with a poor prognosis. Um, and there's issues with limit of detection, as this is done by flow cytometry and also a diagnosis lag time, where patients might actually have central nervous system disease present, but due to the limit of detection of the flow cytometry, they don't actually call it um, disease, central nervous system disease, even though there's leukemia cells present. Um, and so earlier diagnosis with more sensitive methods would give lead time for production of more individualized therapies, such as CAR T-cell therapy, and more sensitive methods might be able to prevent some of the neurotoxic effects from all these patients receiving prophylactic intrathecal chemotherapy if you could better tell which patients had um, early evidence of central nervous system disease. So cell-free DNAs are short, non-encapsulated pieces of DNA in the bloodstream, um, and they're present in the plasma of the blood. And you can see here cell-free DNA circulating through the bloodstream. And cell-free DNA can be released from any cell in the body, and it's thought to be released by apoptosis, necrosis, or even active secretion from cells. And cell-free DNA is being used common in clinical practice today, um, the most common of which is with prenatal genetic screening, where the fetus releases cell-free DNA into the maternal bloodstream. And this cell-free DNA can be isolated and then used for prenatal genetic screening. It can also be used, um, cell-free DNA is being used for transplant monitoring as an outcome predictor for blunt trauma and burns, a predictor of sepsis and shock, post-stroke morbidity, and also is being used in cancer. So cell-free DNA levels in the blood increase as the tumor burden increases. And cell-free DNA that's in the bloodstream that's derived from a tumor is known as ctDNA or circulating tumor DNA, which can be distinguished from cell-free DNA, which is um, normal from normal healthy cells. Um, and so circulating tumor DNA is already being used as a biomarker in cancer. Um, this is an FDA approved liquid biopsy cell-free DNA test. Um, that's approved for solid tumors such as colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and liver cancer, which capitalizes on common mutations that are present in these cancers um, to detect the cell-free DNA unique to the tumor. Um, and it can be used for early cancer detection, guiding cancer precision therapy, monitoring cancer progression, and early relapse detection. And this cell-free DNA that's unique to the tumor is distinguished from normal cell-free DNA via different mechanisms, for the most common being mutations that are present um, uniquely in the tumor compared to the um, healthy cell-free DNA. And so you can detect the, these um, specific tumor-derived cell-free DNA from the mutations by targeted next-generation sequencing or droplet digital PCR. You can also detect methylation changes that are specific to the cancer-derived DNA by methylation-specific PCR or methylation sequencing. And then you can also use, um, look at copy number alterations as well. However, in leukemia, 
There is no panel of common mutations that exists, as in some of these um, solid tumors that have been well characterized. And so we wanted to try and see if there was some other um, way that we could detect this leukemia DNA in the bloodstream um, without focusing on these specific mutations. So we wanted to capitalize on a process known as VDJ recombination. So all T cells undergo VDJ recombination in which different V, D, and J segments of genes are um, rearranged to make the immunoglobulin sequence unique and make specific um, immunoglobulins in your immune cell repertoire. So leukemias will undergo normal um, or undergo clonal expansion. So this here shows normal lymphocytes, which are a heterogeneous population. And some of these lymphocytes will undergo malignant transformation. And then you'll get expansion of these leukemic clones, each of which has um, the sim similar or the same um, BDJ recombination in the same clones. Um, and these will overtake the normal lymphocytes. Um, and so we thought that we could use these specific BDJ recombinations to track the cell-free DNA in the leukemia over time. So this cell-free DNA project is twofold. First, developing a um, circulating tumor DNA assay for the unique clonal rearrangements of these patient leukemia cells based on the BDJ recombination as a biomarker of poor prognosis, and then developing a universal cell-free DNA assay using methylation analysis. So traditionally, cell-free DNA um, was sequenced by Illumina sequencing or next-generation sequencing. And this sequencing um, is both time-extensive time, um, and very costly. And so it could take anywhere from a few weeks to a month to get sequencing results back from patients. And it's extremely expensive to be running on every patient. So with the advent of third-generation sequencing with the Minion Nanopore sequencer, which uses um, electrical current, to determine the DNA sequence. Um, patient samples can be sequenced within a few hours and it costs only about $30 per patient. I um, mean, this is actually the uh, nanopore minion sequencer that we have and it can fit into the palm of your hand and actually be run off of a laptop computer. Um, and so we developed a workflow using this um, minion sequencer where we take the patient samples, isolate the cell-free DNA and then do PCR to amplify these IGH variable regions um, do library preparation, and then sequencing and data analysis. So first we wanted to compare our MinION sequencing workflow to the workflow with the Illumina MySeq. Um, and we took two patients from our study um, and looked at the, uh, the DNA, either the genomic DNA from bone marrow biopsy of these patients at diagnosis, or the cell-free DNA isolated at diagnosis and then post-treatment from two different patients, patient four and patient number 10, um, with either MinION sequencing or Illumina MySeq. And we found that the same leukemic, uh, or the same clones popped up in these, both of these samples. Um, and these clones were actually present at similar proportions in both samples um, across all the treatment or across all the different time points. And so this showed that our MinION workflow actually performed just as well as Illumina MySeq for our assay. Um, and so we decided to move forward with using the MinION sequencer for our study to track the um, leukemia derived or the leukemia clone derived cell free DNA. And so um, for this study right now, I'm just going to show you the data from two different patients. One patient that was MRD negative or cleared the disease after the first cycle of treatment and one patient that was MRD positive um, or didn't clear it. So this patient here was MRD negative um, and clear disease. And so we looked at the genomic DNA from bone marrow biopsy at diagnosis and then the cell-free DNA at diagnosis and then throughout treatment through the end of induction chemotherapy. Um, and we were able to detect the cell-free DNA derived from the leukemia clones that made up more than 5% of the clones present at diagnosis. Um, and we were able to actually see the response of um, this patient to therapy with these, uh, this cell-free DNA from these leukemia-derived clones not being detectable uh, midway through the induction chemotherapy. Um, and then in the patient who had minimal residual disease present, we were able to detect these um, cell-free DNA from the, derived from the leukemia clones present 
throughout induction chemotherapy and even at the end of induction chemotherapy. And we're able to tell which clones were not or were potentially not responding to treatment. Um, and so this was great that we were able to use the clonality of the cell-free DNA as a potential um, predictor of response to treatment and separation of poor prognosis in ALL. As I mentioned, central nervous system disease is a major clinical concern. And so we wanted to see if we could use the cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA um, derived from these leukemic clones in the, cent or in the cerebral spinal fluid as well to uh, detect the central nervous system disease. So we again looked at genomic DNA from diagnosis of two patients. Both of these patients clinically had central nervous system disease present um, by flow cytometry. And we also looked at the cell-free DNA isolated from the cerebral spinal fluid at diagnosis and then throughout induction chemotherapy. And we were able to see um, cell-free DNA derived from these leukemic clones present at diagnosis in the cell-free DNA of the spinal fluid in both of these patients. And this actually disappeared um, throughout treatment, which matched what we were seeing clinically in these patients as well. And so this is actually the first time um, that it's been shown that you can detect um, cell-free DNA in the spinal fluid of patients with ALL. So we were really excited by this method. We were able to actually track um, cell-free DNA derived from the leukemia cells, both in the spinal fluid and in the plasma of patients. However, um, this process is a little bit labor intensive um, and requires some, um, some expertise in data analysis um, and sequencing interpretation and you have to sequence each individual patient sample. And so I wanted to try and come up with a method where you could use a more universal method, similar to how they use common mutations in solid tumors to try and track this cancer-derived cell-free DNA over time. So I looked at the possibility of using differential methylation as a potential biomarker in circulating tumor DNA. And we took these patient samples, um, isolated the genomic DNA from diagnosis, and then performed methylation sequencing on 10 samples that were collected here um, in clinic. And we found that based on the methylation profile, we were able to cluster these um, patient leukemia samples from the healthy um, control samples. Um, and there was about an even split of hyper and hypomethylated regions that distinguished these leukemia samples from the healthy controls. And so we identified a large number of um, differentially methylated regions of hyper and then hypomethylated regions shown by this volcano plot. Um, and so to start narrowing this down, we um, compared this to two publicly available methylation sequencing data sets um, from 372 diagnosis samples and identified 55 differentially methylated regions that were in common between our patient samples here and then these publicly available data sets. And so now I'm currently working on validating and developing a methylation specific PCR and droplet digital PCR assay um, for trying to track these methylation specific or these cancer specific methylation sites in the cell free DNA over time. So to conclude the second part of my talk using cell-free DNA as a potential biomarker in ALL, I've shown that nanopore minion sequencing performs as well as aluminum IC at detecting cell-free DNA from leukemic clones. I've shown that our minion workflow can be used to monitor the response of leukemic clones throughout treatment, and that we may be able to detect central nervous system disease and poor prognosis ALL at the molecular level to risk stratify these patients. And finally, that differential methylation might be a potential universal biomarker in cell-free DNA in ALL. And so I just wanna take a few minutes to acknowledge many of the people who have contributed to my work and made all of this possible over the last four years. Um, first, for Jesse, for being the best PI that I could have possibly imagined working for. Um, I can't express enough how much that your guidance and mentorship has meant to me. I think you probably thought that I was crazy four years ago when I came to you and asked to join your lab without even rotating, um, but I'm really glad that you took a chance on me. Um, while in the lab, I was able to do a lot of really cool things. Um, I was able to film a Jove methods protocol with Henry, um, where we actually got to um, be videotaped injecting all these zebrafish um, and making a xenograph model. Um, I presented my work at a ton of conferences all over the country, um, 
And then I also um, spent countless hours in the zebrafish lab. And I'm sure many of you don't know what a zebrafish lab looks like. So this is a picture of just a few of the tanks that are present in our zebrafish facility, probably from about like one data point on my graph. Um, and this is what I've spent the last four years of my life looking at. Um, and so I also wanna thank some of our lab members, especially Yelena and Shilpa, who helped with a lot of the data collection and data analysis for the cell-free DNA project. Um, Anna and Henry, who isolated all of the patient samples um, for the cell-free DNA project over the last three years. Um, Elise and Kristen for helping me with the limiting dilution transplants, um, helping with screening and cleaning thousands and thousands of fish tanks over the last few years. Um, and then Min for all of your help with the PRL3 project. And also I wanna thank um, Christine for feeding our fish, taking care of the fish and helping with anything over, over in the fish lab. Um, and then Caroline and Min for being the best co-graduate students um, and the best of friends over the last four years. Um, and also to Henry and Stephen and Mary and all the rest of the Blackburn lab um, for helping me with various projects um, as I uh, had my hands in just about everything we were doing in the lab over the last few years. It required a lot of help from people in the lab and the entire lab for making it just a really fun place to come to work. Um, I also want to thank the MD-PhD program at UK, especially Dr. Whitehart for all of his help and guidance, and then Therese and Laura um, for being the best moral support. Uh, my collaborators, Dr. Badgett, who helped with um, coming up with this l 3 DNA project, collecting patient samples, um, and then uh, Chi over in the biostatistics core for helping with um, analysis of all of these patient samples, especially with the methylation analysis um, that would not have been possible without their help comparing them to the public data sets. Um, and, and then also my dissertation committee, Dr. Andres, Dr. Evers, Dr. Gao, Dr. Worth, and my outside, outside examiner, Dr. Cassone, for all of your help um, and guidance throughout uh, my time in graduate school, the Department of Biochemistry for being a great place to work, and the Markey Cancer Center, especially Aaron Oakley and Dr. Kathy O'Connor for all of your help and guidance throughout the years. And then my funding, um, I've been supported by the NIH uh, Cancer Center T32 over the past few years, the past three years. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do all of this work without that funding support. And then our labs funding, um, the NCI and the New Innovator, um, the St. Baldrick's Foundation and V Foundation have supported the PRL3 and Leukemia Stem Cell Project. Um, and then, as Jesse mentioned, the Kentucky Pediatric Cancer Research Trust Fund for making my uh, side project of cell-free DNA a possibility. Um, and then lastly, I wanna thank my family and friends um, for all of their support as well. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions um, and thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk. Okay, great job, Megan. Thanks. Um, so, if you guys want to either unmute yourselves and ask Megan a question and say hi to her, that's fine. Or you can put something in the chat and um, I can read it to her. Paul Murphy says, good job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Everyone's just saying, like, good job, amazing talk. I guess. Hi, um, this yeah. is Jeremy Wood. Yeah. Um, can your uh, PCR assay that you've developed, could that be used to measure other types of DNA? For example, it, you know, in the current epidemic, um, could it be used to measure for the presence of viral DNA? Yeah, yeah. So um, you can do the PCR and then library prep and MinION sequencing on any any DNA present, yeah. Yeah, the MinION sequencer is a really great tool. Um, you can just pl plug it into your laptop computer and have sequencing results within a, a 30 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
um, Megan. I was yeah. wondering about your talk on the leukemia stem cell uh, frequency and then the PRL3 so pathway involved. So mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning the uh, SARC pathway maybe uh, as a target of a uh, PRL3, and then later you also talk about the beta catenin, maybe the downstream of uh, PRL3. Um, how do you think about the two different pathways maybe contributing or interacting among the, the phenotypes? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I think that the SARC signaling pathway is definitely contributing to the migration um, phenotype that we see in PRL3. And so the escape of the cells into the circulation um, and escape from the niche, um, which also might be involved in self renewal as well. Um, and then the beta catenin signaling we've looked at is more with the stem cell frequency. Um, and I think that's probably expressed in just a subset of um, leukemia stem cells in the tumor and not actually expressed in the entire leukemia sample. Whereas I think the SARC signaling is probably expressed more throughout the entire leukemia. Okay, I guess since it's a little after 10, we'll just close this up and Megan can answer all the questions at her defense part. <laughs> Thank um, you, everybody. Yeah. yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And for her committee, we're gonna meet in um, 2.31, just when everyone gets over here, maybe in like 20 minutes or so, Megan can take a break. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just uh, email me if there's any trouble or, anything and we'll see you in 20 what, minutes or so. Jessica, what's the best yeah. entrance? Um, so if you go to the Kentucky Clinic Bridge, go across the bridge, that'll bring you straight into BBSRB on the second floor. Okay. Um, and then just walk down the hall. We'll have the door open. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks.